just sharing a little bit with you tonight. I want to preface this, and I'm not a preacher, I'm not a speaker, but I might be able to teach just a little bit, so we'll see. Um, Anthony called me yesterday, and as you know that um, his grandmother passed away, and he is at the services for her, and he said, what is God teaching you? What is God revealing you in your time with him? And I was like, oh, yeah, I got something. I got something that he's doing for me. I want you to think about something tonight, and I'm not going to be long. Um, my son Billy's going to share a little bit, and we'll be very t timely, but if you'll just kind of gaze up here. You got a habit? Do you have a habit? What is a habit? Anybody? Webster says... Webster says a habit is a settled or regular practice, especially one that is hard to give up. So do you have a habit? Do you have a habit? Do you have something that you do, almost without thinking, that would be hard to give up? Two types of habits. What are they? Bad habit or a good habit. Let's go bad habit first. Bad habit. Anybody? Anybody got a bad habit? Oh, a little confession time. What about these? Um, checking your phone. Like, just check your phone, check your phone, check your phone, check your phone, check your phone. Like, checking your phone without even thinking about it. Just let me check my phone. Not, no, no, don't, you don't have to do that. You don't have to check it right now. You're good. You, you don't have to check it. You don't, you don't have to, you don't have to check it. Thanks. Yeah. You know, checking your phone. Um, maybe, ha maybe there's something you say all the time. I didn't realize that I had a habit of saying this until I was teaching one time. And some of my students say, Miss Edwards, every time you read a passage in the Bible, you say, that is good stuff. And I was like, really? They said, yeah, you do it every time. That is good stuff. I had a habit. What about skipping breakfast? Bad habit? Yes. Your health teachers have taught you this. Skipping breakfast is a bad habit. What about a good habit? Good habit? Good habit? Somebody got a good habit? What's your good habit? No, no, never mind. He's got a good habit, but you don't have a good habit. What about brushing your teeth? Yes, Mom. Brushing my teeth is a good habit. Um, what about exercise? Exercise is a good habit? I have a habit. Um, there is a man that is my favorite person on the whole planet. I tell him that all the time. He is my very favorite person. He's been my favorite person for a long time. He's my husband. Um, he, we've been married 23 years. I know I'm not hardly old enough to be married that long, but yeah, surprising, but true. Every day when I get home and, um, he works really close by and a lot of times he's home when I get home, I go in and I give him a hug. Hugging my husband is one of my good habits. How many days does it take to make a habit? 11? Four. 21. Who said that? Bingo. 21 days to create a habit. How many days to break a habit? Anyone? How many days to break a habit? One? No? Actually, 21. So it takes 21 days to make a habit. It takes 21 days to break a habit. That means if I have a bad habit, I can break it and make a good one in 21 days. What do I want to talk to you about? I want to talk to you about the habit of reading God's word. Being in his word. Just reading his word. I um, am a lot older than you. And I've been doing this thing for a long time. I have a testimony of grace. Raised in a Christian home. My granddaddy was my pastor. Led me to the Lord. Baptized me at a young age. Um, there's so many things God's grace has kept me from, and I'm so very thankful. I've, I've read, I've done devotion books, and, and um, sometimes I do my quiet time at night, and sometimes I do it in the morning, but just recently I said, I want just the habit of reading God's Word in the morning, not necessarily reading a devotion book, or I teach Bible, so I study the Bible to teach the Bible, and I'll sometimes teach on Sunday mornings when I'm studying, but I want to just read it. I want to just read his word, not for the purpose of teaching or not for the purpose of, of some type of session that I'm teaching or speaking. I want to just read it 
I just want to read his word. And so I've started just reading his word in the morning, not with an agenda, just to read his word. Now, there's two reasons I'm going to hopefully share with you that I believe is the reason that you need to create the habit of reading his word. The first one that I believe is, it's good. It is good. This word is so good. I'll never forget being in Charleston one time and we were walking through the park, you know, the little water park down there in Charleston, you know what I'm talking about? And there was a lady sitting on the bench and she had her Bible open and I walked by and went, that is my favorite book. She looked at me a little funny, but I meant it. Like, this is my favorite book. This book is so good. It's intriguing. It's better than Netflix. It really is. It's intriguing. It's exciting. It has so many interesting things in it. And the most amazing thing is about his word, and I'm an avid reader. I like to read a lot. But this is the only book I can read over and over like it's brand new. If you have your Bibles with me, I hope you do. I want you to turn to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. It is the second of the Gospels, a little bit of the life of Christ. I'm going to jump into one little passage, and I'm going to try to convince you it's a pretty exciting book. Ready? Mark chapter 1, Mark chapter 1, Mark chapter 1. You're there, you're there, you're there. Mark chapter 1. I want you to look in verse, chapter 1, verse 9. Ready? Let's ask the Lord to bless. Father, I love you so much. I think of the words of the old hymn, Father, I need thee every hour. And Father, I so need you this hour. Lord, I absolutely believe that your book is such an incredible gift to us. And if there's some way that I can beg or plead or convince these students, that that's the greatest thing that they could do is just spend time in your word. It'll change their lives. And it'll be more than worth it. Father, I pray that in the same passion and love that you've shown me today, that that passion and love will be shown to them through the reading of your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Mark chapter 1 verse 9 said, In those days as Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Do you see it? Do you see that? When you read the Bible, I want you to see it and taste it and smell it. These are real people. This is not a story. This is not a Disney movie. These are not caricatures. They're real people. Do you see John? Do you see him in the water? Do you see him not in a baptismal pool of a church, but where is he? Where is he? Um, where do you think he is? He's in a body of water. Okay. Probably not in a plastic pool. Probably in a lake or a pond or a river. Okay, so you see him? Sure. I like that. Um, John, what do you look like? Long hair, kind of rough looking. Oh, actually, might be kind of interesting looking. Forget rough, interesting. And it says Jesus was baptized by him. And it says when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit, capital S, the Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit, descended on him like a dove and a voice came from heaven you are my beloved son with whom, with you, I am well pleased. And then look at verse 12. The what? The spirit. I just read that, didn't I? That means the same spirit that fell out of heaven in the form of a dove and came in the presence of Christ when he was baptized is the same spirit that does what in verse 12? It says the spirit immediately drove him into the wilderness. wonder what that looked like. wonder what it looked like for the spirit to drive Jesus into the wilderness. So I'm like, are you picturing it? So I see in my head what I think Jesus looks like, and I see in my head what I think John looks like, and I see this body of water, maybe some kind of river, and then the heavens open up. Hmm, I wonder what that looks like. I don't know if you saw, but the sky was pink tonight. But I wonder if somewhere in the midst of pink clouds, they just kind of parted. And here comes this dove and and this capital S spirit. And then that same spirit drove him into the wilderness. I wonder what that looked like. I wonder if the spirit just cajoled him or if if the spirit whispered in his ear. 
I wonder if he went quickly into the wilderness or if I wonder if he kind of walked slowly into the wilderness. It says that same spirit led him into the wilderness and he was in, in verse 13, and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals. And the who? The angels were ministering to him. Ah. Oh. What does it look like for angels to minister? What does ministry look like? Ministry looks like time. Ministry looks like attention. Ministry looks like conversation. I mean, can you picture this a little bit? See, the Bible is so good. And I read you one little piece. One little piece of Mark chapter 1. But in that little piece, look at what all we see. We see baptism. We see obedience. We see God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We see the Trinity. But what, what do we have to do? We have to read it. we got to read it. I'm encouraging tonight to make the habit of what? Reading his Bible. Reading the Bible. Reading God's Word. I'm encouraging you in the next 21 days to make a habit of reading his Word. His word. Why? Because it is good. You will love it. There is amazing stories. Did you know there was a judge named Deborah? There was only one female judge. You'll find her in the Old Testament. Did you know there was a queen named Esther? Did you know there's a book of the Bible that is named after a woman who is not a Jew? Someone in my Bible class? Ruth. Good job, girls. Ruth. She was a Moabite. They were polytheistic. They believed in multiple gods. And yet God chose to take her and show in her a plan of redemption and name a whole book of the Bible after her. Did you know the sun stood still? Did you know that one man prayed for the Lord to extend his life for 15 years and he granted it? It's pretty crazy stuff, isn't it? I want you to read the Bible because the Bible is good. And you will love it if you just read it. Turn to your neighbor right now and say, to, let's go neighbor to the right, neighbor to the right. Turn to the neighbor to the right and said, you should read your Bible. Now turn to the other neighbor, turn to the other neighbor and say, because it is good. Because it is good. I want to tell you one more reason I believe that you should read your Bible tonight. And then I'm going to let my son Billy share a little bit. And the second reason I believe you should read your Bible is because you need it. It is good. You will love it. And because you need it, I need it. I want um, to read you a passage out of 1 John. First John, kind of towards the back of the New Testament, it is one of the first of three letters that John wrote. 1 John chapter 1, verses 5. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all what? All what? All what? Sin. Cleanses who? Cleanses who? Us. It cleanses you? Us. The light of Christ cleanses us from all sin. We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And his what? Word. It is not in us. I need to read the Bible. I need to read the Bible because I am a sinner. And here's the problem. I don't know that we really believe that. I don't know that often I really believe that. I don't know that I often believe I really am a sinner and I really need his word. See, if I put my life on scales, you know, kind of like, you know what I mean when I say scales? Here's what happens. I'll look at my life and I say, I mean, I 
I'm really not that bad, am I? See, in one hand, I have the good. In one hand, I have sin. And I say, well, I haven't killed anyone. <laughs> feeling pretty good. Haven't stolen anything. Ah, oh, feeling even better. Pretty generally a nice person. Well, yeah. So I'm relatively a good person, so I don't really need the Bible. I don't need, really need his word because my sin quotient seems really small. So who needs the Bible? Well, who needs the Bible? There's people that have all that sin in their life. But here's the thing. What am I measuring by? What am I measuring by? Because I said I have never killed anyone, and I said that I've never stolen anything. But the Bible says do everything without arguing and complaining. Ooh. I argue or complain. What just happened to my scale? The Bible says do not worry about tomorrow. Oh. What just happened to my scales? See, what happens is I've got my scales all mixed up because I argued today and I gossiped today and I complained today and, oh, did I worry in all caps. And so I need it. I need it. I need it. I don't just need it for the moment of salvation. I need it because I'm a work in progress that is not finished. Most of you have heard me say, if you've been in my classes, I love Ruth Graham, and I love what she wrote on the epitaph. She says, construction is complete. Thank you for your patience. See, construction in me is not finished. I know it's not finished because I'm standing here right now. And it won't be finished until I see Jesus face to face. And so until that moment, I am a sinner and I'm a sinner who needs the daily blood of Jesus poured over my life to cleanse me from my sin. And what do I need to measure my life by? I need what we just read in John. I need the word. I need the word of God. I want you to read this because it's good and you'll love it. And I want you to read this because you need it. I need it. I don't want to stand before the Lord and him say, the truth is not in you. You did not know my word. I want to know his word. You know how you turn to your neighbor on the right and you said, read your Bible? And then you turn to your neighbor on your left and you said, because you love it? I want you to look right at yourself for a minute and say, I need it. I want you to read your Bible because I need it. I need it. I was sharing with Anthony when he asked me if I had anything to share to you, and that is really what God has put on my heart that I beg you and plead you and challenge you in the next 21 days. It is February 1st, March 1st, to create the habit of reading God's Word. you got tools like crazy. Um, Bible Gateway, a new version can give you all types of reading plans and drop it in the palm of your hands. But I, I encourage you. But there's one thing I shared with Anthony. And that is not only has God given me a fresh desire to read His Word, but I've watched this a little bit. You're getting ready to meet, um, hmm, I would say, a pretty handsome 19-year-old. I'm just a little bit partial. Uh, my son, Billy Edwards, um, is spent the last few weeks reading the book of John. It's been so fun at my house because he's been like, Mom, did you know? Have you? Did you know? Have you read this before? Did you know the Bible said this? Mom, look at this. <laughs> so many things. He has, has he ever read the Gospel of John before? He's been in Christian school his whole life. He's been raised in church. So what's the difference? What's the difference in him in all these years of school and church that he had never heard of the Gospel of John before? There's a difference because he's reading it for himself. This is my Billy. Uh, hello. I've never spoken one of these things before, so I don't know how loud I am right now. <clears throat> it's 
So I'm going to introduce myself. Um, like she said, my name's Billy. I'm her son and Becca's older brother. Um, I graduated from Metro last year, um, and I'm at Wingate now. I'm on the track team, living, loving life, all that good stuff. Um, and like she said, I am going to talk to y'all about John today. Just And the reason why I chose John is because, like she said, that is what I've been reading. And um, in one of my classes right now at Wingate um, is a, a full level religion class um, on the book of John. So it's pretty unique. Or not really unique, it's kind of hard. But, um, <laughs> um, but that is why I chose John. And there's a lot of... Like she said, this is the first time I've actually read through the whole book of John. My, one of my assignments from my professor was to sit down and read through the whole book of John in like one sitting. And I was like, are you crazy? That's like a long time to sit there and look at words. And um, so I didn't do it in one sitting just because I'm a really, really slow reader. So it took me a couple of days and I read like a couple of chapters at a time. Um, but I eventually got through it. And there was so many things that I learned just from reading the scripture, like, blew my mind how you actually learn about God when you read the Bible. Um, but there's so many things I can talk about. And when she asked me, um, or when Anthony asked her, when she asked me to talk, I was like, I have no idea I'm talking about so many things. But then there was just one thing that I guess God kind of laid on my heart um, that I wanted to share. And that's in John chapter 9. If you will turn your Bibles there. That wasn't a suggestion. I'm just like telling you because you're in the Bible. And then I'm just going to read through, I'm going to read the, it's only like 12 verses because it's the story of the blind man, um, Jesus healing um, the blind man. I'm pretty sure all of y'all have heard this story, but it starts in chapter 9, verse 1 as, as he was passing by, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples questioned him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus answered. This came about so that God's works might be displayed in him. We must do the works of, of him who sent me. While it is day, night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After he said these things, he spit on, his, on the ground, made some mud from the saliva, and spread the mud on his eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he washed and came back seeing. His neighbors and those who formerly had seen him as a beggar said, Isn't this the man who sat begging? Some said, He's the one. No, others were saying, But he looks like him. He kept saying, I'm the one. Therefore they asked him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. And then that's the story. Um, and when I first read that, I had heard that story many times because I did grow up in Christian school. But there was one thing that I caught when I read it on my own that I hadn't caught before. And that is the man didn't receive his sight until he went to the pool and washed. I was like, well, that's, I've always thought he like wiped the mud on his eyes and was like, boom. He like saw, like right there. That's like two different stories, you know? Because the man could have been like, had mud on his eyes and heard Jesus say, go to this pool of Siloam and wash. And he could have been like, dude, I'm blind. How do you expect me to get there? Like, I don't know. I can't see where it is. But no, he like obeyed God and what he said and somehow, I don't know how, somehow, got to the pool and washed. And after he went there and obeyed what God had said, he received his sight. He received the blessing because he had obeyed what God said. And I was like, oh my goodness, that's, that's so powerful because, I mean, so many times today, people, including me, I'm not just talking about, um, want the blessings from God without the work. You know, they want they want all the they want to be received, I should say. Um without obeying him and without like 
doing the work, you know, because, I mean, that's a lot of work for a blind man to go to a random pool and wash. I mean, if you think about it, it really is. And there's a lot of work sometimes that God calls you to do, and you're just like, I don't think, I don't know, am I supposed to do this? You know, there's like a lot of challenges and obstacles that he puts in front of you, and you're like, I have no idea how I'm going to overcome this obstacle or complete this challenge. Um, and then you just want the blessing at the end of it. We just take it one step at a time and trust in him along the way. Because, I mean, he can see the path that you're going to take. He knows where you're going to go. And you just have to trust in him to get there. And um, one of those issues is that you want um, about like reading, the, uh, reading your Bible, like my mom was saying, is that you want the answers. Like this word is this. And you want to know him without reading the Bible. I mean, that was that was for me at least. Even though I grew up in Christian school, I was like, you know, I'm always busy. So I'm like, oh, it's like, and then you got homework, and then you got sports, and then you got to sleep. I mean, you at least need to get 12 hours of sleep. But, um, and then you got to eat. And you're just like, oh my goodness, I have no time. It's like crazy. You have no time to read this. And um, then you just want to know the answer. You know, it's like, I don't want to, I don't really want to read this today. I don't, I don't feel like it. But, and, um, but you want the answers and then you want to, you want to, and I wanted to know God, but without, without reading it. And that was pretty much impossible to do. Um, so to see, to receive the answers and to actually know God and have the personal relationship with him that we are, are called to have. You actually have to read his word. And and my professor um, in the drawing class, um, when she gave us the assignment to like sit down and read through the book of John, um, I've always heard like people saying like, you know, you want to make, you want to make time to read the Bible. Like I know you're busy and you have all these things but you just want to try to fit in your schedule to read the Bible. Like, just make time. And my professor said something different that, like, really hit me. And it was like, she was like, no, like, you have time. I'm looking at her, I'm like, woman, like, I'm a student athlete. I have zero time. It's, like, crazy. And she was like, no, you have time. She was like, how much time do you spend watching Netflix? I was like, a lot. <laughs> I love watching Netflix. <laughs> She's like, how much time do you sleep? Do you spend eating? I was like, a lot. How much time do you spend napping? I was like, a lot. And she like named all these things. And she was like, no, you have time. It's just your choice if you're going to do it or not. I was like, whoa, that was kind of harsh. <laughs> um, but that's so true. It's like, we all have time. It's just our choice or not if we're going to do it. Like the Lord, I mean, he gives you so many choices. And one of the best examples I've ever heard of this is um, it's like it's like a cell. So you picture a cell, like a prison cell. I don't want to say too many cells, but it's a prison cell. Um, so like bars, and you have like your bed. I've never been in prison, so I don't really know what to have, but... You have your bed, and you got, like, the little toilet, and they bring you food and stuff. And it's like you're sitting in this cell, and you have everything you need to be comfortable, you know? And everybody likes being comfortable. I like being comfortable. I have, like, three pillows on my bed, like a big blanket, and I like to be comfortable. But everybody likes to get, like, be comfortable. They like to be taken out of their comfort zone, you know? And you have everything in that cell to make you comfortable, and the door is wide open, like, you can leave, you can walk out of the cell whenever you want to, but because you're comfortable, you stay there, you know? And then one day, that prison, del, that prison cell door shuts, and you're stuck in there. And you realize that you're stuck in there, and you can't get out. And once you realize you can't get out, you want to get out. And that's the best example I've ever heard of, like, our lives and living without God. God's standing on the outside of that door, and he's like, please, 
please come know me. Please, I, I, I want to know you. I want you to get out of that cell. He's like, I know it's going to be tough. He knows it. I mean, he never says in his Bible anywhere that this is going to be easy. He actually says it's going to be hard. He says, take on my yoke because it's light. But he knows it's going to be hard. But I'm here to tell you, it's so much, it's so worth it. And it really is. So don't, it's not really, but don't like sit in that cell. You know, because like, you know, when you die, that cell door shuts and you can't get out of it anymore. Just like um, the rich man, the beggar, whenever he died, he looked up and, and saw the beggar. And he couldn't go back up there as much as he wanted to. He couldn't even have a drop of water. So I guess my main point in all of this is to make, I mean, not make time. You have time. And it is your decision to read this word. And it is so worth it. It'll, I mean, it'll bless your lives beyond measure. It will. And you'll have the answers to people who have questions. And you'll know them. You have the personal relationship with, with God. And yeah, there's going to be some tough situations along the road. I've been through some. Everybody in here has been through some. But they're worth it. Because he's with you. And he always will be. that encourages you and everything that you can come and say some stuff that I forgot to say at the end and then I'll close Um, but thanks for listening to me and not falling asleep and stuff I have no greater joy than know my children walk in truth I echo the words of John Um, to watch him see how life-changing God's word can be. It was a great joy for this mama. Make a habit of reading his word. Why? Because it's good. You will love it. There's so much in here. And you've been in church. You've heard Anthony preach. You've heard Sunday school teachers. You've heard Pastor Mike. And you've heard so many of these stories, just like Billy said. He had heard about the blind man being healed before. But when he sat alone with the Lord in his word, he heard it different. He heard it new. He heard exactly what God wanted to say to him. That in the midst of that healing was amazing obedience. 21 days. Make a habit of reading his word. There's two more short verses I want to show you real, real, real quick. One is Psalm 139, and most of you have probably heard this psalm before. Does anyone have any idea what verse is in Psalm 139 that's very um, often quoted? What is it? Yeah, what you got? Um, Psalms 139, verse 14. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I praise you because, I praise you because I am faithfully and wonderfully made. That is awesome. That is awesome. Woohoo! That is perfect. He is exactly right. Psalm 139, verse 14. I want, if we continue in Psalm 139, verse 16, it says, Oh, verse 15, your frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in what? In secret. Guys, do you know that the Lord wants to meet you and speak to you through his word in the same place he created you? Do you hear me? Listen to that carefully. You are fearfully, wonderfully made and your frame was not hidden from him when he knit you together in a secret place. I want to show you one more verse in Psalms. It's Psalms 51. Psalm 51, verse 6. Behold, you delight in what? Truth. Is that what your your version says? Psalm 51, verse 6. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. The same God that made you in a secret place, wants to meet you in that same secret place through his word and through his truth. Isn't that amazing? See, no one was there when he created you but you and him. 
He knows you better than anyone else. Nobody knows you like he does. He knows your strengths and he knows your weaknesses. He knows your fears. He knows your goals and your desires. And he wants to meet you right there through the truth of his word. And he wants to guide you in all those things. I encourage you. I plead with you. I beg you. Don't let his word just be fed to you. Eat it yourself. It'll change your life. 21 days. Today is February 1st. It is good. You're going to love it.